So, let's get the show on the road. No more distractions. So, Ascendant is the first thing people see when they when they first see you. It's the image sort of like you project. It's also your physical appearance, and it's sort of the mask we wear in public. Now, yours is in Scorpio. Scorpio is extremely intense. So, people are going to be intimidated by you regardless of what energy you really have like the first thing people are going to think when they see you is like they're going to sort of step back if people are like around you for a long amount of time um oh i'm sorry i will get rid of this jenna Codex, thanks for following me let me mute this though so that that doesn't happen Grod, I muted myself. Let me mute the desktop. Okay. So, uh, when people are around you for a long, a long amount of time, sorry, girl, my fucking hair is a mess today, and it's gonna distract me. I look like shit. Yesterday's stream was crazy. I was up really late. I didn't sleep much. Sorry again. All right. Let me stop getting distracted. So. Um, when you have a, a, a Scorpio Ascendant, it's going to make you seem intimidating. So whether or not you feel like you're intimidating, because I always tell people, like, the first house, other people are going to see it. So it doesn't mean that you're going to feel it. What you feel is your moon sign, and we'll get to that. But what other people see is pretty much what falls in the first house. So other people are going to see you as someone who's intimidating, someone who they're a little bit afraid of. Uh, a little bit of fear goes a long way. Um, somebody who definitely has a sort of, like, uh, energetic pull to them so you're gonna be feeling people are gonna feel like you're magnetic uh, uh, you're either going to make them feel really scared or make them feel really like pulled in because Scorpio is all about control so uh, excuse me when you have excuse me you're ascendant in Scorpio it gives off like a very powerful uh, vibe like this is the level of like this is a level of fierceness that most people wish they could have um, when it comes to like first impressions, sometimes that's not always the best thing, because, you know, if you really want to make a sweet impression, sometimes it's hard until they, you know, talk to you a little bit more. Now, I will tell you that your sun is in Libra, and Libra is a very great placement to pair with this, because Libra is very sweet, it's very innocent, very charming, you know, extremely likable, especially when it's in the sun sign, because your sun is your ego, and it's all about, you know, harmony and balance, and, you know, not stepping on anybody's toes, and supporting people, and uplifting them. Um, but the problem here is that that's not going to be what people first see when they see you. What people first see is that intimidatingness. Like, even before they approach you, they're going to feel like maybe you're not as approachable as, as you really are. And then once they start getting to know you, the Libra is going to be activated. And the Libra is going to be like, oh my god, you're so likable. Oh my god, you're so sweet. Oh my god, you're so innocent. That's like... That's like the Libra energy. So it's, it's great paired with this placement. This is somebody who's, for instance, like... The, the image that I would project in my head based off of a Libra Sun and a Scorpio Ascendant is someone who is like really beautiful, very innocent looking, but if you fuck with them would be like the queen who sliced your head off herself. Uh, you know, like, like if you were, uh, uh, you were uh, sitting on a throne and if someone fucked with you, you'd smile on their face and then, you know, stab them if you needed to. Uh, that's like, obviously it's an extreme, but that's like the type of energy that the two of these are sort of having on you, which is a really great thing. And, it, and it's, I'd be surprised if you didn't have people like either admiring you or like really wanting to be with you, like really loving, oh, here we go with this fucking shit really wanting to sort of, you know, either be you, you know, like, or just like an inspiration or someone they're afraid of, okay? Let me mute. Let me just remove the alerts altogether. Hold on, I'm going to move the alerts so that we don't even have to deal with those. <sighs> I can't do anything without this psychopath doing something. Okay. Anyways, so moving on. You're a moderator now. <laughs> I went ahead and modded you. I need all the help I can fucking get in this stream. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't have to if you don't want to. I don't even know if it worked. Did it work?
It just says you, it won't let me mod you. It won't even let me mod you. <laughs> it won't even. It just says is not a moderator of this room. It says is not a moderator of this room. That's all it says whenever I try to moderate you. It's just in that draw. I don't know. Okay, anyways, it's okay. We got it. Moving on. Okay, so your son is in Libra and your son is in the. Let's see what this is. What house is this in? Your son's in the 12th house. Can't touch this. Okay, your son's in your 12th house. So when you have your son in your 12th house, my concern with this is the 12th house is karma and the 12th house is like past life uh, karma and past life balance and sort of like the 12th house is, is almost like having something in jail. So your son is your ego, okay, and your sense of identity. And when we see that in the 12th house, it's really, really damaged. So when it comes to, you know, projecting a strong image, you're going to struggle with that. When it comes to believing yourself, you're definitely going to struggle with that. When it comes to confidence, when it comes to your sense of self and who you are, um, you're going to struggle with that. When it comes to, uh, you know, boundaries, I see a lot of problems with boundaries with son in the 12th house, allowing people to do things. Because what happens when your son's in the 12th house is like, Everything related to the sun, which is ego, sense of, sense, of, sense of identity, you know, who we are, our courage, things like that. It gets fucked up and it turns on its head. So it's like, for instance, the sun wants to be in the first house. That's its favorite place. So your sun is in literally the place that it doesn't want to be in the, the most. And so what happens is your life puts you in, in, in positions where your going to feel like you are treated as if you are less than and because you've been in so many positions that you've been treated like you're less than you start to believe that and so as you sort of progress in your life because this will be a lifelong thing okay as you progress in your life you start to realize that you're actually stronger because of the shit that you've been through than when you first started out. So like, for instance, if I were to have my son in my first house, I'd be really confident, really like sure of myself, maybe a little bit cocky, you know, a go-getter, getting everything I want, not caring about other people. But because you've gone through these certain things, it's sort of damaged it. But in the end, by the end of your life, you realize that you're stronger than everyone else because you've had to deal with the shit. So it's almost like baggage, baggage when it comes to ego, a sense of identity, self-worth uh, so when you start out it's gonna be a little bit of a tough placement especially when you're younger uh, but as you start to get older and older and older all the way up until you know you're you know an elderly person you're gonna be the person who's like that people are gonna go to when it comes to how did you find yourself how did you how did you establish your identity how did you achieve all the amazing things that you achieve because this is, this is a lifelong thing because the 12th house is karma. So you got to remember, this is not going to be something that it's like, oh, you have to do this and this to fix this. This is like almost like a journey for you. It's not the destination, it's the journey. So remember that when it comes to like you feeling down about yourself or feeling like you can't stand up for yourself. Just remember that every single thing that you've gone through in life is building you to the point that you need to be at. So a lot of astrologers will tell you, shit that'll be like oh this is a bad placement this is a bad placement fuck that it's not a bad placement i think this is a fantastic placement because you have to remember if you have your son in the first house you're a cocky son of a bitch right and so you don't care about other people so you never have to learn how to help people because you know you're selfish and so you have the opposite where like you're helping so many other people and because you're doing that you become a very strong person so you know it's like you find your strength through your weaknesses Okay, which is a very powerful thing. So I'm very passionate about the sun in the 12th house. That's why I went on it for so long because a lot of astrologers do not understand the 12th house. I, the 12th house and the 8th house are very closely related. The 8th house is death, sex, and occult and a bunch of other crap. 
obsession, shit like that, secrets. And the 12th house is karma. So the both of them are very feared in astrology for no fucking reason. Um, I have a lot of placements in the 8th house, which is very similar to the 12th house. So I'm very passionate about those two houses, and I don't like the bad rep that they get. Because I have people coming to me all the time like, I googled this, and it says this and this. I'm like, shut the fuck up, they don't know what they're talking about. So... Sorry I went on a big thing on there, but I'm very, very focused on the 12th house. The other thing I'll tell you about the 12th house is that because it's karma, you know that at the end of the day, everything's going to work out. You know, whereas the 8th house is a little bit more up in the air, the 12th house always comes back around. It's a full circle moment. So wherever you started, know that you'll end up circling. Um, your moon is in Taurus. Now, moon is emotions. When you have your moon in Taurus, okay, it's a little bit of a struggle. Um, you know, your emotions... Um, need to sort of be expressed. So when you have it in Taurus, it's very hard, okay? It's very rigid, it's an earth sign, and it's very stubborn. So these people are really, really difficult to crack, okay? They wear an extremely hard protective layer uh, when it comes to their emotions. Like, you're gonna have to not only unlock the, 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 chain, lock, the chain lock, you're gonna have to unlock the door, and then you open that door, and there's another door, and you open that door, and there's a trap door. Like, these people, it takes a lot to get through to them. Um, and then once you're in, you're always in. These people are extremely loyal, especially once they open up to you uh, when it comes to friends who they really love they love them forever they're going to do things for other people moon and taurus is going to be physically doing things for other people they're going to be the amazing listeners when they let you in they're going to be paying attention to what you do they're going to sort of have a have everything you've ever done in their head so that they can help you extremely helpful but my one problem with moon and taurus is that sometimes they because they're so you know they're so they're all about trust and because they're not very trusting of people and they're very quiet you have to be careful about alienating people um you know sometimes i see them being so protective that they miss out on opportunities with people because not everybody is like willing to jump through ho ho hoops uh to get to you and so some people obviously they're not worth it so you don't you don't want them in your life so that protective layer protected you but other times you could miss out on a connection with someone because they didn't jump all the way do you know what i mean so my only suggestion with moon and taurus is to make sure that you take into consideration that you may be a little bit more um a little maybe a little bit too rigid that you know maybe your guidelines are a little bit too strict when it comes to trust and opening up to people so not that they're bad because they're great and they're fantastic but make sure that you you allow a natural steady progress and that you don't sort of like close off completely because these people will close off and they'll retreat and they'll hide uh especially if they feel like you're untrustworthy the other thing i will say about moon and taurus is that they have no problem cutting bullshit off so if somebody wrongs them uh as long as they haven't like completely given their all to them because if they've given their all to them remember i told you taurus doesn't let things go so you'll never let go of that feeling that you cared about that person but if you didn't care about them all that much you can cut them off and never think about them again um it's also a very sensual sensitive sign okay so these people are definitely going to the one thing i will say about moon and taurus and this is just my personal thing. It may not apply to you, but I found this to be a big thing. Taurus is all about uh, the, the nice things in life, and Taurus likes to eat. And when I see the moon in Taurus, a lot of times these people do have a tendency to emotionally eat. Um, so, you know, it's just, a, it's just a thing to throw out there. Um, you know, be careful about that. Um, okay, let's see what house this is in. So this is in your seventh house okay so seventh house is partnerships and marriage and one-on-one -on -one relationships so when i see uh moon here um your emotions are going to be tied to other people so the problem with this is that uh, excuse me before you find someone trustworthy you're going to be close off right you trust them you open up to them the thing is is that the seventh house is all about learning. When a planet is in the seventh house, you learn whatever that planet is through other people. So your emotions, you're going to learn about yourself and your own emotional being and your own emotional state through your experiences with other people. You're going to learn how to handle your emotions through experience with other people, which means that a lot of times you're going to mess up. 
Um, a lot of times I see people with moon in the seventh house have regrets when it comes to how they act, reacted to people, you know, in the past, or they end up seeing themselves, you know, in someone else, uh, how they acted, or they have a similar situation and they're like, oh my God, is that me? Like, it's a very self-reflective moment uh, with this. What The other thing I'll tell you is that you're going to be much more needy it when you are committed to somebody than you are when you're not uh because the moon will seep up on you so like you'll sort of get to a point where if you care about someone you're gonna care about them so much that you're gonna need that comfort from them because the moon is is gonna be sitting in the seventh house which is next to them so you're gonna be surprise yourself about how sort of needy you can become uh you know because you go you're gonna go from guarded to like needy like that once you're like really in love and this could even be a friend too but it's not doesn't have to be like romantic love but like the moon wins so when it's in the seventh house it's gonna win so try to not fight that neediness try to work try to work with it try not to like be too needy but don't be like too not need you know what i mean like you have to learn to balance that for instance i have my son in my seventh house so i learn about my sense of self and who i am through other people so i again can relate to you with with a placement like this in the seventh house uh it's actually a really great placement as well because when it comes to you know when it comes to being married or being in a relationship or even being a close friend your your moon is here and the moon is very nurturing and so you're very open and you're very loving and you're caring and you will care about your friends and take care of your friends the moon is like mommy and the mommy takes care of so you're definitely going to take care of the people you love it's a great placement um mercury is in scorpio so mercury's communication scorpio is no bullshit cut to the chase so these people are not going to sort of they're not going to be blunt because Sagittarius is more blunt, but Scorpio is not going to bullshit to you. So if you wanted an honest opinion uh, and someone who's going to tell you, Mercury and Scorpio is great at this. Um, the other thing I will say is that when they are upset, they will sort of go for low blows. If someone pissed you off enough to where they got you super angry, uh, Mercury and Scorpio is definitely going to say something really, really below the belt. So I'm sure you've already experienced this and know that you are capable of this and you don't do it. But it is something that, you know, Mercury and Scorpio is great at. Um, these people love to figure things out. When it comes to investigating, Scorpio loves to get down to the nitty gritty. Um, they definitely like abstract sort of ideas that they can sort of float around in. They like to figure how things work, how it's made. Um, they want to understand some human psychology. Why do people act the way they act? You know, um, these people are great problem solvers. These people are fantastic at figuring out the hows and the whys. Um, the only, the only uh, problem with this is that sometimes they can get sort of fascinated by something a little bit more darker or taboo uh you know sometimes they could go down like i've seen mercury and scorpios who've become like experts at serial killers because they like that sort of dark edginess uh they're not afraid of 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 you know maybe something other people deem you know like Ooh, you know what i mean uh they're definitely down to sort of play in the mud they're down to get dirty which is not a bad thing um so let's see where this is placed. This is in your first house. So having your Mercury in your first house is a really, 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 really great placement. Um, your first house is your is, is what everyone sees and it's yourself. So people are going to see your Mercury. So people are gonna see that you're really intelligent. People are gonna see that you're really communicative. They're gonna, they're gonna think that you're really great at talking to people, even if you don't feel like you're talking to people. They're gonna think you're really articulate. They're gonna think that you're the first person. If I were, if I were, to, if I were to pick off of a sign who I would throw as the first person to introduce themselves and to say hello to everyone and like sort of like be a great representation of whatever I'm doing, it would be you because you have Mercury in the first house. Like that's great. Like you're going to be great at speaking to people, great at understanding people, great at getting a point across, great at looking intelligent, great at looking professional, stuff like that. The only problem with Mercury in the first house is that they have a tendency to teeter on the know-it-all side. So sometimes they don't realize it. Sometimes they're going to come across as either a know-it-all or a little bit like pushy with their opinions. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, when I see this placement, nine times out of 10, uh, if you tell them, they're usually very much like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that, sorry. So like, this is probably more for other people than it is for you, but like, 
have I, I am going to tell you that having Mercury in the first house, sometimes you come across, you know, not the not not exactly um, uh, not pompous, but just a little bit more like like a know-it-all. So we have to be careful about that, just because you know tone is very important. That's really it. Um, Venus is in Scorpio, and Venus is in the in the first house. So. First of all, having Venus in your first house, you're going to be seen as beautiful, okay? Because it's Venus is beauty, uh, and Venus is also money, and it's in the first house, which is you. So, a lot of times when I see Venus in the first house, these people are told that they're beautiful their whole life, but it doesn't penetrate. So, they'll be like, I'm not beautiful, but everyone else sees it. Like I told you, other people see the first house more than you see it. The other thing I'll tell you about Venus in the first house is money. Here, these people definitely acquire money like these people are going to have money like money is going to come to them success is something that they love and they're going to get addicted to sort of success they'll get addicted to the money and money fuels them um a lot of times these people are given money uh you know not necessarily always an inheritance but like if i were to look for someone who i think is going to climb up in, in, the, in the ranks and sort of achieve things faster than anyone else it's going to be venus in the first house because venus is just like i need money i love money give me money and people will just give money so great placement if you're looking to sort of rise up in ranks great placement if you're worried about money because you're always going to have money um so if you're ever feeling like oh my god money's really tight sit tight Venus will shine once something aspects Venus, especially if Jupiter aspects Venus. In, in, in the, in the, at, when Ju whenever Jupiter aspects Venus, you're going to see an increase in money for you and you're going to have an increase. So great placement for that. Also great placement for knowing how to earn money. Definitely a hardworking placement. Well, I should say a hardworking placement until they acquire a lot of money. Then sometimes Venus spends its money crazily. So you have to be careful about that once you acquire money. Sometimes Venus is like, I want to buy all the beautiful things. And they're like, oops, my bank account. So you have to be careful about that. Um, other thing I'll tell you is your Venus is retrograde. So Venus is also a relationship. So relationships are definitely going to be a struggle for you in general. Um, understanding your place in a relationship very much a struggle uh self-esteem definitely a struggle because retrograde means it's slow so it's moving slow to where it's almost moving backwards um so uh when venus is retrograde sometimes these people have trouble you know accepting that they're beautiful have trouble accepting compliments have trouble have trouble feeling like secure in what they're wearing or what they're doing um this is definitely something that will be a lifelong thing um but What's great about this is it makes you not cocky. Because if you didn't have this, you could potentially be like, I'm the, I'm the best looking person in the world. I'm so hot. I'm so beautiful. So it's like charts balance each other out because, you know, we're not made to be monsters. So because it's in the first house, it's also retrograde. So it's like a check and a balance. So while it might sound terrible on paper, it kind of balances you out. It's not that bad in my personal opinion. Uh, the other thing I will tell you is, again, when it comes to spending money, sometimes you're going to have regrets with Venus and retrograde. Make sure you think your purchases through all the way. Um, you probably already do that. Um, okay, moving on. Mars is in Aquarius. So Mars is passion, sex, and aggression. Okay, Mars in Aquarius, when they're angry, they detach. So... Aquarius doesn't like to get attached, so when it does get attached, it needs an escape plan. So when Mars is angry here, um, it's definitely going to be someone who holds it in. So Aquarius is the water bearer, and it holds in its, its feelings, okay, until all of a sudden it fills to the very top and explodes. So when you have Mars in Aquarius, um, my one thing that I tell people is make sure that you don't hold everything in and then have that epic explosion. Um, make sure that you know that you're about to overflow and that you release it properly when you're midway. This is something you're going to have to learn about yourself uh, because if you allow it to overflow, it always ends up in like this dramatic outburst and people aren't going to understand. So that's, that's a problem. Um, when they lash out at people, it's typically going to be in a very, obviously they, when they reach a dramatic point, it's going to be dramatic, but just like the subtleness, it, it, it's almost in a detached, nonchalant way. Like a lot of times I'll see Aquarius, Mars and Aquarius, when they're angry at someone, they will sort of like throw baby hints, like 
almost to the point where the other person is probably never going to pick up on it. Maybe they'll compare them to someone else. Maybe they'll say like, oh yeah, you shouldn't have probably done that. And like, they'll give those little things. And that's like the sign, like I said, this is more helpful for people around you than it is for you. That's like the sign that the Mars and Aquarius is starting to get annoyed. Those little baby things. Um, when it comes to sex, okay, and I'm not going to make you too uncomfortable, but um, I am going to touch on it. Um, Mars and Aquarius is all about freedom okay so well i guess a different type of freedom because freedom typically falls in sagittarius but there's a sense of like there's a sense of like shedding of skin so you know how the age of aquarius was all about like doing what we want and you know you know all that hippie stuff mars and aquarius is down to try anything so it doesn't mean that, like, we like to joke about how Mars and Aquarius is a freak, because a lot of them are, but it's more along the lines of, I'm willing to try anything as long as my partner wants to do that, as long as who I'm with wants to do that, I'm willing to try it. I will try anything once. If I like it, I'm going to do it, regardless of how it sounds. If I don't like it, I'm never doing it again. So, because you got to remember, Aquarius is the sign of friendship, so they're definitely fluid in terms of like, oh, what do you do? Let's see what you do. Ooh, what do you do? Like, they're, they're, sometimes they take pieces of other people. So they are definitely someone who's down to try anything. And if they like it, they're not afraid to be a little bit kinky. I mean, I've seen it tons of times with Mars and Aquarius. The other thing is sometimes I see Mars and Aquarius struggle with... Now, for you, it's a little bit different because you have placements in the seventh house and Libra here. But if you had different placements, I'd be like, well, Mars and Aquarius sometimes has trouble committing because they want a little bit of everything and they don't really want to be tied down. A lot of times Mars and Aquarius are the first people to be like, I want to, I want to be polygamous or I want my cake and eat it too, friends with benefits. So, you know, you have that energy. It's much more subdued because you have a lot of strong placements like Taurus here and your placements in the seventh house that are making you much more loyal, especially your, your son in Libra. But if you didn't have any of those others, I'd be concerned. Um, let's see what house this is in. It's in your third house. So Mars Mars in the third house picks up Gemini traits because it's communication. When you're angry, there's going to be a verbal lashing. There's going to be a verbal lashing when you're angry. It's just going to happen. So watch your words when you're angry. Um, the other thing I'll tell you is in the bedroom, these people will be vocal. So if you don't start out vocal, you'll end up becoming vocal because talking. So Gemini loves to talk. So it adds that little bit of Gem Gemini flair to it. Um, my other suggestion, just throwing this out there because you have it in the third house, if you haven't tried any sort of like, uh, I mean, I will give you the speech that I give typical Mars and Gemini. It's going to be lesser for you because it's only in the third house. But if you haven't tried role play, you haven't tried, you know, phone sex or anything like that, you might enjoy it. Just throwing that out there. Moving on. Jupiter is in Pisces. So Jupiter expands whatever it's in. And it's expanding it in Pisces. Um, Pisces is all about helping other people. So it's going to give you a really, really big sort of like target because Jupiter is like the target in your chart. It's going to give you a, um, a target towards like, charitable things which is like self-sacrificial and helping other people so the more you do for everyone and not for like the individual it's going to bring you luck in life and it should be something you want to do already typically we're drawn to whatever our jupiter is in for instance my jupiter is in leo and i'm very dramatic and i like you know i like i'm i'm a little vain i'm i it, i admit it and it's in my eighth house which expands death sex and the occult and it's why i'm interested in tarot cards and all that stuff like we, it, it, we're drawn to jupiter no matter what we do um my problem with this is that your jupiter is retrograde so you're going to naturally feel a little bit unlucky um so understand that you feel unlucky sometimes but it's not the universe out to get you it's just your reward is slower than everyone else's. That's all that means. Um, let's see where, the, where this is placed. Mm. This is in your fourth house. So Jupiter expands the fourth house. Um, this expands home and family. So this can expand it in, in a lot of different ways. Um, it's going to be hard to like sort of say which one it applies to you. Sometimes this means that you have multiple homes when you're older. Sometimes it means you had multiple homes. Sometimes it means you had multiple parents, like maybe parents, you know, you had multiple, you know, multiple sets of parents. Sometimes it means you had a lot of, you know, a big family. Uh, uh, sometimes it means that your family came from a big family. Sometimes it means that 
uh, your family was very helpful to you. Maybe they gave you things or maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe you have someone in your family who's very, very intelligent and sort of gave you wisdom. It's just because Jupiter is higher learning and luck and expansion. So that's in your fourth house. So it's one of those where it's like there's like a big sort of like smile on the fourth house. So know that at some point I expect you to have, even if none of that makes sense, what I will tell you is expect at some point for you to have <laughs> two houses. Uh, it's very rare that someone who has Jupiter in the fourth house doesn't have at least two homes. So you're going to be successful enough to have two homes, baby, so enjoy it. <laughs> um, the other thing I will say is that for you, uh, the fourth house is like cancer, so it's a very nurturing placement. So if you ever are interested in having you know, a family of your own, you'd be a natural. If you're ever interested at sort of like focusing some sort of you know idea when it comes to like family or you know security it'd be great for you to be a natural working with children things like that um okay moving on i'm almost done you guys i'm sorry these do take a while and i try not to look at the chat because then i get distracted and it's even longer okay saturn is in sagittarius so saturn uranus neptune and pluto are generational planets the sign they're in doesn't matter as much as the the, ho the house that they're in because your whole generation get, gets affected by the, the sign that it's in, but the house is unique to you. Uh, so Saturn is like dad, okay? And it teaches us hard life lessons. So there's a bit of restriction wherever it's placed. Um, and yours is in the, let's see what house this is in. Yours is in the first house. So remember how I talked about how your Venus was retrograde and you're not gonna feel that? Well, Saturn is also here say, giving you a really tough sort of like, tough go of things when it comes to your sense of identity and your physical appearance. Uh, so it's going to make it even harder for you to sort of accept compliments, even harder for you to believe that you're, you know, beautiful or attractive, even harder for you to believe that you're worth the things that you get. It's going to make it even harder uh, for you to feel like, um, like, uh, like you're, you're accomplishing things, even though you are just know that that is nonsense. So you gotta learn to tell yourself that that's like the, the voice in the back of your head that you just have to ignore because Saturn comes back around. We have our first Saturn return usually when we're in late 20s, early 30s. And so you'll be hitting like a sort of bump in the road when it comes to your physical appearance and sense of identity. Some point around there, you'll hit like another like slap in the face or be like, fuck, that sucks just by life but by the end of your life you're going to be so confident in this in this area that it's like like i told you this is very similar to the 12th house you're going to be so confident in this area that you're not going to give a shit you're really not going to give a shit so i know a lot of times life is hard uh especially when it comes to you know like achieving uh with saturn in the first house but know that that will always sort itself out. It's your sort of life journey. You know, we all have a sh of, of a problem. For instance, my Saturn is in my twelve, my second house of income and self worth. So, <laughs> it's no surprise that I struggle with accepting compliments as well. No struggle, no surprise that I struggle with, uh, you know, my uh, getting compensated, getting you know money, you know, acquiring money, you know, having my services being worth anything uh you know uh accepting gifts from other people so like you know we all have our thing so i don't want you to feel too you know like i don't want you to feel like it's just you everyone has a thing that's what makes us human um sometimes these people do have a sort of uh sometimes these people do have a pushy father figure it doesn't have to be a male but it's just someone who is like an impromptu figure uh sometimes they have a pushy person because it adds an aries like trait to that person so sometimes i see you know these people are very much you know like someone around them usually like nurturing father-like energy is very very pushy um okay let's move on oh the other thing about sagittarius with Saturn and Sagittarius. Sagittarius is all about travel. So sometimes I see these people, sometimes I see them like be be really, 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 really careful. I have to, they have to be really, really careful about traveling because when Saturn is in Sagittarius in the first house, my only concern is like, make sure that when you do travel that you are very, 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 very meticulous with your plans. Because sometimes Saturn will be like, oh, 
You thought you were going to travel and that you weren't going to figure out exactly what you're going to do. Well, this just fell through. Maybe you should have thought that through. Oh, this plan that you had when you were doing this, guess what? Burnt. I just fucked that up. So that's, it, it shouldn't be too big. It's not a very strong thing. It's a very small thing, but I throw it out there just as an extra. Okay. Uranus is big ups and big downs, and this is in your second house. So this is self-worth and income. So, uh, it's, your income is never going to be like this. So if you think that your income is always going to be like this, get used to it, baby. It's going to be like this. So you'll have moments where you're making a lot. You'll have moments where you're making very low amounts. It's going to be, you're going to have to learn, uh, excuse me, you're going to have to learn how to deal, how to like sort of save. And I'm sure you've already figured this out, but you're going to have to learn how to save when it comes to this moment. So when you're this high, make sure that you don't spend it all. It's that simple. Um, it's not that not that hard of a concept, but for you, it'll be a little bit more of a focus. Um, and Neptune is uh, uh, Neptune uh, is like disillusionment and illusionment. So and, and and it puts a little fog wherever it is, and it's in the twelfth house. So I mean the second house. So um, as well. So sometimes we can be a little bit delusional with how much money we spend. A lot of times I see it's like I spent all this, like I was talking about before. It's kind of funny. It's, charts are circular. Um, I spent all this money on this thing and I didn't realize that I spent all this money and it really wasn't worth it. So sometimes they, they get, especially Neptune gets a little bit excited. They're like, oh my god, I really like this, I really like this, this is worth it. And they buy it and then they realize, oop, I have regret. Because I didn't think that through, there was a little bit of a fog over it and I didn't exactly understand that. So. If you've already experienced this, you've probably learned that about yourself and you're probably at the point where you're just like, no, I'm not paying this unless I know, da -da 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 -da. you know, I'm very meticulous with what I spend now because I know I have the tendency to do this or, you know, you get stuck on that trap. Uh, it's that simple. North Node and Aries. This is a trail fucking blazer. North Node is your life path this life. And when it's in Aries, it's meant to do whatever it wants to do for itself only. This is a very independent person. Now we run the fuck away from our North Node because we want to go to our South Node because our South Node is something we've done before and this is something we've never done before. And as a Sun in Libra, Libra is the opposite of Aries. So Libra wants to partner up, but Aries wants to be independent. So you're really gonna run from this, but you are a go-getter, you are a trendsetter, you are a trailblazer, you do what you wanna do and you better make sure that it serves you. So. You're being given permission to be selfish in this lifetime. Last lifetime, you were way selfless. Last lifetime, you gave up everything for someone. This one is all about you. So make sure you enjoy yourself. Don't ever feel guilty for the things that you do. You're supposed to be this way. Um, don't ever feel like you're not worth it. Don't even feel like you're selfish. You are being given permission. So make sure that every impulse that you have that you follow through because you're supposed to be a little bit more impulsive this lifetime you're supposed to live a little you're supposed to enjoy aries is the first sign of the zodiac it's like a child you're giving permission to sort of be childlike you will always land on your feet i promise you um and this is in your fifth house so it adds a leo like flair okay so it's kind of funny um it's kind of funny because i always talk about how um when it comes to streaming, right? These are the placements that we look for in streaming. Leo and Gemini. Gemini because it's a it's a, the internet and Leo because you're in front of the camera, right? And so I always say that the two placements that are great for streamers are like first house because it's the thing people see, Gemini or Leo, or 10th house because it's your career, Gemini or Leo. Um, but traditionally the fifth house is ruled by Leo. So a lot of times streaming careers end up filtered through the fifth house. So the reason why I say that is because Aries is gonna do what it wants to do, and when it's in the fifth house, it's gonna have fun. You're gonna have fun, because it's a Leo house, and Leo likes pleasures, okay? So Leo's gonna like to be, you know, front and center. Leo's gonna like to enjoy things. Leo's gonna like to, you know, sort of, uh, I guess I should say, not party, because I don't mean like drugs and alcohol and stuff like that, but I mean like, Leo's all about the fun aspects of life. It's like, you know how they say work hard, play hard? Fifth house, sometimes people just want to play hard. And when you have your north note here, it's like you're meant to have fun and experience, physically experience stuff. You're meant to have fun and physically experience stuff. So that's sort of what you're supposed to do. Like, like so it's kind of funny because people were talking about how, you know, you stream your, your, um, your travels and stuff. 
this is what I would expect because Leo wants to be front and center and wants to be seen. And Aries is all about trailblazing, trendsetting, and being spontaneous and doing things. And then you have Saturn in Sagittarius. Like it, it all connects. Basically, we're, you're already you're already using you're already using your sort of your chart. Uh, most people are. Uh, I'm almost finished. So the last few things I will tell you. The last few things I will tell you um, is your seventh house is in Taurus, so you're going to be attracted to someone who is just a little bit quiet, uh, someone who's definitely a hard worker, someone who physically does things for you, someone who's sensitive, someone who is sensual, someone who is shy. Uh, so even if you get attracted to someone who's not any of those things, I'm going to tell you right now, the seventh house always wins. Um, eighth house in Gemini. Again, kind of funny because I was talking about how your Mars was in the third house. Eighth house is death, sex, and the occult. So when it comes to sex, Gemini, they like they like to talk. They like wordplay. They like to be verbal. They like, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, sexting. They like fucking, uh, what's the word? I said roleplay, right? But what's the other word? Fuck. Whatever. Gemini likes the other thing is gemini in, in, in eighth house they like intelligence too intelligence is an aphrodisiac for gemini in the eighth house so um i always joke about how gemini is the the biggest whore in the zodiac because i'm a gemini um and it's like it's like the regina george of the zodiac where it's like it wants sex to be fun that's all it wants sex to be fun and playful um now 10th house leo again not surprised because i was talking about before about how you had your placement in the fifth house and then i was talking about mid heavens and then there it is so mid heaven is your internet persona it's your career uh and it's your public image uh so leo is all about bright colorful mid heaven and leo think katy perry's career you know she's very cartoony and she's very much like colorful that's 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 literally going to be like you she i'm pretty sure Katy perry has a mid heaven and leo um so uh when it comes to your career these people are very proud of what they do very very proud of what they do very loyal very much someone that they want other people to rely on them you scratch my back i'll scratch yours these people are definitely leaders in whatever they do these people are definitely proud like i said these people are confident only problem is sometimes they can come across a little bit a little bit of a bragger uh but we love leos for that um when it comes to uh the internet these people are going to show off uh they might not be like oh my god i bought all these nice things but they're not going to be afraid to share what they have or share the things that they do so that's why i was saying like a lot of people with midheaven and leo will be like streamers because it's like hey you know what i mean so uh it's a great it's a great sort of like it's a strong placement when it comes to like being secure and in, 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 in what you you do for a living and not being afraid to show what you do for a living and not being you know shy about it um but that's pretty much it i got most of the important parts um i hope you enjoyed that i'm sorry it took so long sorry for the distractions i try to go through them as fast as i can um sometimes it takes longer than others i also get really excited because i'm really passionate about this stuff so i get excited and i want to give people as much information as i have and then i also am like oh my god i relate to you so sorry that it took so long um but i hope you helped that and thank you again for subscribing to me and sorry about 